Psychological and physical violence, along with financial control, are hallmarks of intimate partner abuse in both heterosexual and queer relationships. Here are three cases of women killed in intimate partner violence. Thank you for joining me for Women in Love. In November of 1926, the Harlem-based African-American newspaper called the New York Age reported the murder of Louise Wright, killed in a row over the affections of another woman. It is so rare that same-sex anything would be reported and referred to in a newspaper, and there are so few other accounts of the murder that I thought I would quote directly from the article. The article begins... Crazed with gin and a wild and unnatural infatuation for other women, Rita Stabtoff of West 63rd Street, in whose apartment her friends and acquaintances had gathered for a Saturday night rent party, grabbed a keen-edged bread knife and with one fell swoop severed the jugular vein in the throat of Louise Wright of West 63rd Street. After a fierce quarrel in which Reba had accused Louise of showing too much interest in a woman named Claire, known to Columbus Hill as Big Ben. The newspaper explains that Claire got the name Big Ben for, from her inclination to, quote, ape the masculine in dress and manner, and particularly in her affection for other women. The newspaper goes on to report that Big Ben was not at the party, but Louise and Reba got to talking about her, and it was said that Reba warned Louise to stay away from the, quote, man woman. People at the party later told police that they tried to get Louise to leave, but she refused. When Reba grabbed the bread knife, Louise tried to escape, but Reba caught her in the hallway outside of the apartment. And as the newspaper poetically put it, the fatal tragedy followed. Reba grabbed Louise by the hair, jerked her head back, and with a sweep of the knife across her throat, she nearly cut her head off. The death, as the paper reports, was practically instantaneous. When police arrived, only women were present, the newspaper said. It is said that not one man was in attendance. An ambulance from Knickerbocker Hospital took Louise Wright's body to the hospital and then to the morgue. Ms. Stabtoff was taken to the tombs, to the jail. In reading the newspaper report, one might get the idea that the two women were fighting for the affections of Big Ben, but I think, in fact, it seems clear that Reba and Louise were in a relationship, and that's what they were arguing over. Reba was jealous that Louise might have been showing too much attention to Big Ben. This murder occurred during the Jazz Age, and jazz was thought to be a moral scourge that led young women down the path of wantonness and depravity, and sometimes straight into lesbianism. Two weeks after the report of the murder appeared in the New York Age, the newspaper used the murder of Louise Wright and a hit play called The Captive as a way to proselytize against the evils of the Jazz Age, rent parties, and lesbianism. The Captive was the first Broadway play to feature a love story between two women. Rent parties are exactly what they sound like. They were a way to raise money to pay the rent or other bills. They were also considered to be immoral because of the drinking and the opportunity for men and women to dance and possibly have sex without the benefit of marriage. The outrage was doubled on this occasion because it was a lesbian rent party, and as the newspaper said, there were no men present. The editorial ends with, in the meantime, the combination of bad gin, jealous women, a carving knife, and a rent party is dangerous to the health of all concerned. Sadly, I wasn't able to find any information about the trial or any details about the life of Louise Wright other than her murder. On July 4th, 2013, 32-year-old Corporal Crystal Parker, a seven-year veteran of the East Point Police Department in Atlanta, Georgia, was shot and killed inside of her Creel Road home in College Park. Her body was discovered three days later by a friend. Parker had been shot one time in the back of the head at close range while she slept. An extensive investigation led authorities to 30-year-old Danielle Parker, the victim's estranged wife. The two women had been a couple for six years. Danielle and Crystal met in a club in 2006, where Crystal was moonlighting as a security guard. Friends said the two moved in together after only a few days of dating. 
One year after they met, the two were part of a large civil ceremony at Atlanta's Pride, becoming civil partners. After they became civil partners, Danielle Parker changed her name from Dharma D. Dixon to Danielle Alex Parker. And then somewhere after that, the relationship began to fall apart. When interviewed by the police, Danielle Parker claimed that she hadn't seen the victim or been in the house for over a week. But phone records would later show that Danielle Parker was at Crystal's house at the time of the murder. Records would also show that text messages continued to go out from Crystal's phone, even after she was dead. Because of the details in some of these messages, police decided that only someone who knew Crystal well would have sent the messages from her phone. According to police, jealousy was the apparent motive for the murder. Danielle and Crystal Parker had been separated in December 2012, but Crystal Parker allowed Danielle to remain in the home until she could find a place to live. However, at the end of June 2013, Parker asked Danielle to move out permanently. But before this could happen, Danielle Parker discovered that Crystal Parker had begun dating someone else, which enraged Danielle, according to police. Just one day after Crystal had returned from a trip to visit her new girlfriend in Florida, she was shot and killed with her own service revolver. Her wallet, cell phone, credit cards, a receipt for $600 in bank transfers to Crystal's account, and a spent 38 caliber round were all found in Danielle Parker's possession. Police were contacted by a man who said he dated Danielle Parker briefly, and during that time, about a month before the murder, she asked him to kill her former partner, but he refused. He said on July 4th, the day of the murder, he got a message from Danielle saying she was headed to the home of her spouse. She later texted him and said, I did it. Danielle Parker told the police that the two had decided to take a break, but when police spoke to family and friends, they were told that Crystal had ended things. Mr. Parker, Crystal's father, called Danielle Parker a mooch, saying that his daughter didn't seem to ever be able to do enough. According to friends, early in their relationship, the two had agreed that if Danielle Parker studied to become a nurse, Crystal Parker would take care of things financially. Danielle Parker's studies didn't go very far, but the expectation of being provided for remained the same. According to family and friends, Crystal Parker began to feel as though she were being taken advantage of. There was also a pattern of cheating on the part of Danielle Parker, culminating in discovering Danielle Parker and another woman in her home. But Crystal continued to help Danielle with money. Danielle Parker was arrested on July 9, 2013, and the prosecutors eventually took the death penalty off the table. And with that, on November 5, 2014, Parker took a deal for life in prison with no chance of parole for 30 years. Crystal Parker was a six-year veteran of the East Point Police Department in Georgia. She was honored in 2012 as the agency's Officer of the Year. Police supervisors said Parker was ready to be promoted. Friends said Parker's dedication to serving and protecting on the job carried over to her personal life. Crystal Parker, also known as Chris by Friends, joined Alpha Chapter of Sigma Omega Phi Fraternity, a social group for masculine-identified lesbians. She mentored other members and helped establish a scholarship program so prospective pledges could earn their GED. She leaves behind a father, a sister, and a twin brother. 55-year-old Melissa Miller's relationship with 51-year-old Annie Meyer followed the usual course for her, which was meeting a woman, having a fast-moving romance, then stealing from them and disappearing. Sadly, on this occasion, it would be Meyer who would be the one who disappeared. Annie Meyer was last heard from on February 10th, 2013, during a phone conversation with her mother. Authorities searched Meyer's home multiple times after she was reported missing by her co-workers on February 27, 2013, but found no signs of foul play. Even though no one spoke to Meyer after February 27, friends and family continued to receive a stream of texts from Meyer's phone. On March 13, 2013, Meyer's 1995 silver Toyota pickup was recovered from a parking lot three miles from her home. It had been parked there by a man who 
had just bought the vehicle. Meyer's other car, a 2009 Toyota RAV4, was recovered days later on the street. Though Melissa Miller refused to participate in the search for Annie Meyer or speak to the police, she would tell anyone who listened how much she loved Annie Meyer and how much she missed her. She also told people that she was the last person to have seen Meyer alive. Melissa Miller and Leanne Annie Meyer dated off and on, finally breaking things off for reasons that none of Meyer's friends really know for sure. After they broke up, Miller complained that she didn't have anywhere to go, so Annie Meyer allowed her to stay in the basement of her home. Melissa Miller didn't appear to have a job or any means of financial support. So even after they broke up, Annie Meyer continued to help her out financially, but the two would clash over Miller spending. When police looked into the life of Melissa Miller, they found that she had a history of fraud with at least two other partners. On one occasion, Miller took $10,000 from a girlfriend, and when the woman asked to have that money returned, Miller threatened to expose her as a lesbian, and the matter was dropped. A few years later, in a new relationship, Miller wrote herself a check on her partner's account for $32,000, then disappeared from the woman's life. That woman took her own life before she could file a complaint against Melissa Miller. Tracing the money trail, police found that in the days and weeks after Annie Meyer went missing, Miller stole thousands of dollars from Meyer's credit cards, charging everything from groceries to casino trips. Many of these transactions were caught on camera. In July of 2013, Miller continued to refuse to cooperate with police. But on June 4th, Annie Meyer's remains were found, and Miller went to police to submit to questioning. In the course of this conversation, she confessed to murdering Annie Meyer. Through tears and long pauses, Melissa Miller explained that the built-up tension led to the murder of Annie Meyer. She said, It was the stress of all kinds of things that were going on for Annie and for me. It was intense for both of us. Miller said she and Meyer drove to the mountains amidst a brewing argument over how Meyer should spend the bonus money she was expecting. According to Miller, Meyer was considering investing in wine, building a property to get horses, or hiring Miller to renovate the backyard and build a deck. Miller said, it didn't go well, so we came back. Miller said she had trouble recalling exact dates, but said it was shortly after that visit that they took another trip to the mountains when the argument became physical. We were just kind of walking, Miller said. She poked at me, and I just turned with a walking stick as a reaction and hit her. I hit her in the head. She went on. I tried to stop the bleeding, and I couldn't. She told police that she found foil and plastic wrap in her truck and used it to try to stop the bleeding. But after running to the truck again, she returned to find Meyer missing. For two weeks, she kept returning to the area, hoping to find Meyer. When asked about the blood found in her truck that belonged to Annie Meyer, Melissa Miller explained it by saying it came from a nosebleed that Meyer had had earlier. On November 27, 2009, Melissa Miller pled guilty to second-degree murder. Miller was sentenced to 20 years in a Colorado Department of Corrections facility, followed by a mandatory five-year period of parole. Miller, who did not speak during the hearing, except to answer the judge's questions, was also ordered to pay the Meyer family $24,000 in restitution, $8,000 to victims' compensation, and approximately $13,000 to other victims. One of the heartbreaking details that came out was that Annie Meyer might not have died from the blow to the back of the head. The coroner's report said her cause of death was exposure after her body was dumped and left. I am as tired of these crime show tropes as you probably are if you are a fan of true crime. But in this case, I have to say, some of them seem to apply to Annie Meyer. Police said as they were investigating Meyer's background, they couldn't find one person who had one bad thing to say about Annie Meyer. Friends and family to a person said that she was a deeply thoughtful person and giving. And that might have been the very thing that finally got her into fatal trouble. Intimate partner violence has been on the rise over the last few years, 
and often these sorts of stories are buried. Homophobia is part of the reason, but it's also true that as human beings, we seem to be the most interested in stories that reflect our own lives. The result is that lesbians of color and transgendered men and women in domestic violence situations can find it very difficult to get help that they need to get out. If you or anyone you know is trapped in a cycle of intimate partner violence, please check the resources below. You deserve to live a life free of violence of any kind. Please subscribe and like the video. Thanks for joining me. See you next time.